Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to check out the mighty AMD Sempron 145. This is a 2.8 GHz single core CPU with 1 MB of L2 cache. It has a TDP of 45 watts and it's on AMD's socket AM3. And while in 2010 there would have been no mad rush to go out and wipe out the stock on store shelves, uh, these were more intended for very budget systems from OEMs such as HP Compaq, Lenovo, and eMachines. So this CPU is unused in the original box, although previously opened. And in the box we get the CPU, some sort of documentation that no one has ever read, and this awesome Sempron sticker that you can slap on your rig and impress your friends when you haul it to the LAN party. Oh, and the original boxed cooler with the original thermal paste still intact. So let's get this installed in our system and check it out. The platform that we're using is the ASUS 990FX AM3 Plus motherboard, since you know we're going to be overclocking this, and the familiar GTX 260 GPU. Against my gut instinct, we're testing this at Windows 10 on a Samsung SSD with 8GB of DDR3 1866 RAM and a slightly larger CPU cooler and fan than the stock one provided. Once everything's attached, we can get it powered up and ready to go. First thing that we need to do is enter BIOS, set the date and time, and then make sure that everything is set to the default settings for our baseline benchmarks. Once in Windows, we can see everything looks as it should, so naturally Cinebench R15 is the first up, so we can get a baseline and see where we sit. With Cinebench wrapped up, uh, we got a score at 1.8 GHz of 65, which really isn't that bad for a single core CPU. So instead of showing each individual benchmark at stock and then going over them all again with the overclocked results, uh, I'm just going to go through and I'm just going to do uh, stock and overclocked at the same time. Here you can see some of the settings we use in our overclock. We had a final overclock of 3.8 GHz, so we gained 1000 MHz by overclocking. That in turn increased our Cinebench R15 score to 87. I also decided to use 3 Mark CloudGate for this comparison, and that's just another score to be able to use to compare our stock and overclock results. So this benchmark runs two GPU benchmarks and a physics benchmark for the CPU, but you will see the effects of the CPU overclock on the GPU scores as well, or it, it, technically you should. Stock configuration, this setup received a score of 2656 overall with a graphics score of 11,851 and a physics score of 715. Once overclocked to 3.8 GHz, our overall score went up to 3364 with a graphics score of 11,873 and a physics score of 959. A nice feature of 3 Mark is the ability to compare two runs in detail. Just select the two runs you want to compare, get the damn cookies bullshit acceptance out of the way, and then click compare. Now you can see the difference in a little more detail. Next up is the Tomb Raider built-in benchmark, and these are the settings that we're using for all the runs. At the stock frequency of 2.8 GHz, the Sempron 145 got an average FPS of 39.6. Overclocked to 3.8, the average went up to 47.6. And of course, Crisis. Crisis is the perfect game to use to benchmark a CPU into shame. And these are the settings that we're using for all these benchmark ones. Large transmitter. That must be the jam station. 
At 2.8 gigahertz, the results ain't good. Barely maintaining double digits, dropping to single digits when the action gets heavy. The CPU spends almost all its time at 100%, and it really isn't a good experience at all. And this is one of the easier to run levels, the late game wouldn't be playable at all. Crisis, of course, prefers two cores, so single core CPUs just don't cut it. This is Crisis at 3.8 GHz, and you can see we've improved quite a bit, but I still don't think you can play late game at all. So I was going to continue here and uh, benchmark a few more games, but I decided I would stop here uh, for the sake of time because uh, this CPU, we can unlock a second core on it and we can make it a dual core Athlon 2. And the more benchmarks, the longer this video would end up being. So after unlocking and restarting, the CPU info is wrong, but it's now an Athlon dual core. We'll set everything to default again, with the exception of the V-Core, which most likely needs a slight increase to be stable, and then we can get our baseline numbers. Jumping into Windows, CPU-Z shows it's a Regor core, so it's an Athlon 2 X2. That means we now have two cores with 2 megabytes of L2 cache. We also lost our CPU core temp monitor and hardware monitor, but yeah, it is what it is. Back to Cinebench R15 for baseline, and with two cores at 2.8 GHz, our score is now 137. So now it's time to overclock the CPU with two cores. I didn't just copy the settings from a single core overclock, because on a single core, 3.8 GHz took only a small increase to V-Core. But an unlocked CPU usually needs a little more V-Core due to the fact that now you have two cores for one, but also uh, chip quality may be deficient on the core that you just unlocked. So here you can see uh, changes being made in the BIOS and at some point I start to just give quick stability checks in Windows just to make sure we're not going to crash for the benchmark that we want to run. And our final result was 3.7 GHz, but that was at almost 1.40 volts V-Core. RAM and HT-Link is about as fast as it will run stable as well, so let's jump into some benchmarking. In Cinebench, the, our score jumped up to 181, and looking at the graph, you can see where the CPU sits now compared to the others. Running the CloudGate benchmark, stock configuration received a score of 4592 and overclocked to 3.7, we're now at 5595. And here you can see the comparison of the two runs. So 2013's Tomb Raider benchmark, you can see MSI Afterburner also reports CPU temperature at zero degrees here, so we still have no temperature monitoring. 
but we do have an average FPS of 51.5 at 2.8 gigahertz. And when we go up to 3.7 gigahertz, that's now gone up to 57.3. With two cores, even at 2.8 gigahertz, we see a massive improvement in crisis. We now see average FPS in the 30s, and at least in this part of the game, it's absolutely playable. Even more so at 3.7 gigahertz, with average FPS around 40. And with no action on the screen, you can see here the FPS really takes off. So at this point, I was like, well, maybe I can try a few more games. So here's Alan Wake's American Nightmare at 1080p max settings, including max AA and AF. It certainly seems playable now, even though we're averaging a little less than 30 FPS. So then I was like, why not try GTA 5? So here's the settings that I used, and staying with 1080p, this is the result. At first everything looks good, but as you go on you start to notice textures not filling in correctly or just plain missing, like the roach coach flying through the air. As we keep playing, it only gets worse, with more textures disappearing, the road looks like the detail starts to fade until the road just disappears completely. And this is all on the CPU, as you can see lowering the resolution has absolutely no effect at all. So is this a CPU that, that anyone should just rush out and buy? Absolutely not. Um, if you're using this to play older games, there's far better alternatives. There's uh, faster single core Athlons, and there's definitely better dual core CPUs that you don't need a, a particular motherboard to be able to unlock. But it was fun. Um, I picked this up dirt cheap, and I figured I would have a little bit of fun with it. And I hope you guys found this interesting. So you guys take care, and as always, we will see you on the next one.